uh, oh, excuse me, Masoon, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to come on and I look forward to it. I won't take up any more of your time. Take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Misun. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on here. I am super nervous. Um, I don't know why. I just am. <clears throat> but um, by God's grace, program of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship. I've been sober since January 27th, 1995. And for that, I'm truly grateful. So uh, I just celebrated 26 years last week and um and when i first came to alcohol Anonymous, i didn't mean to get sober or stay sober or any of that i didn't even know anything about alcohol Anonymous. i didn't know i was an alcoholic um although everybody else around me told me i was but um it took me really a long time to actually consider to my innermost self that i was an alcoholic <clears throat> I hung around Alcoholics Anonymous, but I didn't hang around. I walked to uh, AA meeting three times a day, every day, my first year. And it was that nine month point when my sponsor said, read the vision for you. So I was reading it and it says, it talks about the hideous four horsemen. And it says unhappy drinkers who read this page would understand. Now my tears running down my face, I called my sponsor and I said, I understand this page. What does that mean? And she said, that means you're an alcoholic, just like the rest of us. And I said, no, I think it says that I'm an unhappy drinker. But um, these are the things that I don't know. I mean, I just, I thought I knew everything when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I really didn't know anything. Um, and the, uh, so I am one of these people that um, basically drank for that special effect that does not happen to other people. And I, I grew up in, uh, in Korea. Uh, my parents were uh, quite abusive, but um, that is not what makes me an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because when I take a drink, I get a special effect. And that effect happens to be special so special, I would eventually sell my soul little by little for all those drinks. Um, I'm the one who violated every ounce of my spiritual being in order to get that drink. I had to drink no matter what. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I ended up in uh, detox in Jacksonville. I was living in New York and I ended up in detox in, in Jacksonville. And then Actually, my sister was going to al meetings in, in Jacksonville, Florida while I was partying. And um, I didn't know that until I got sober. And, and um, so I ended up in detox. I spent five days there. And then I came to, uh, that was, that's how I got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because I didn't really have any place to go. And um, I had a lot of issues when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, first of all, I uh, grew up in an environment where there was no God. Um, I used to think I was atheist, but people in Alcoholics Anonymous told me that I was too lazy to be atheist. So I guess I was just like agnostic wanting to be atheist, I don't know. But I grew up in a family, my parents always told me there's no such a thing as God. God is for stupid people who don't know any better. And the, that's the idea I had. That was concept for my God. And I remember telling my sponsor, I said, because you guys talked about God a lot. I mean, they talked about God all the time. And there were things on the wall that says power greater than myself. And I'm thinking, you know, don't, you know, trick me like that. I know what that means. And um, I remember, and, and, and and then you guys always read that thing. May you find him now. Like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I gotta find him now. And um, I was telling my sponsor, hey, there's no such a thing as God. God is for stupid people who don't know any better. And my sponsor said, well, then I guess you won't have any problem. And, uh, and that's, that's how it all began. That was the kind of thing that I heard in Alcoholics Anonymous, but only, um, 
I was very unhappy newcomer. I was angry. I was angry. And I think uh, Bill Wilson talks about it a lot in his uh, writing and, and this particular reading that we just read, Sam read. And um, he talks about depression. And um, for me, it's uh, self-pity. And my self-pity always shows up in anger and rage and and just, I, I was one of these newcomers that just people didn't even talk to me because I was so mean. Um, you know, they, will, they were trying to be kind. They will say things like, hey, you know, you must be new, what's your name? And I will say, hey, back off. This is an anonymous program. You don't have to know my name. I don't have to know yours, you know, kind of thing. And they wanna give me a hug and I say, I don't need a hug and they will say, what if I need one? And I will say, well, don't be so needy, back off. And uh, so I came to known as the hostile newcomer. I was, uh, I behaved so bad. Um, I don't, I don't know how anybody tolerated me, but <clears throat> here I am. And um, so that's all I knew. I mean, if I had any emotion, I knew about anger. I knew about resentment. I knew about anger. And and I am one of these people who just uh, hated what I'd done and hated who I'd become and came to Alcoholics Anonymous that way. And um, <clears throat> so um, my first sponsor, the well, first one, I kind of got rid of her because she was a little too overly excited about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know, she was just kind of like, whoa, in my face, I said, oh, this is not working out, so I'm going to get a new sponsor. And she said, oh, oh thank God, my prayer is being answered. So I got a second sponsor, and her name was Mary Frances, and she's the one who took me through the steps. Um, and, you know, I was, I, was go I was doing well. You know, I was going through the steps, whether I liked it or not. I was miserable, but I was doing the, doing the deal, I guess, the action part. And, um, you know, it and my $4.75 an hour job, it was a part-time. They wouldn't give me a full-time job when I was new because they said I was too emotional. So I was making $4.75 an hour, part-time, being a cashier, and then which it turned into you know, a full-time job at this uh, company that I, I worked there for a really long time. And I was able to get house and a car, when I was new, I didn't even have a car. I didn't even know how to drive a car because uh, I lived in New York. Therefore, I never have gotten a DUI, but that's another story. So um, things were getting better outside, you know? And, 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 I, and I remember people talking about emotional sobriety, emotional bottom. I'm like, what are they talking about, you know? And, um, and I really didn't know, and I really couldn't care less about it because I, I associated with the depression and I was like, oh, that's a medical thing. It has nothing to do with the work in Alcoholics Anonymous and blah, 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 blah. And uh, not knowing that that's what I was really suffering from. And I'd gone through a couple of um, periods in my sobriety where uh, I was so... I mean, I don't know if I want to use the word depressed, but feeling sorry for myself. I think self-pity is basically depression, but um, where I didn't even want to get out of bed, you know, and I, I couldn't tell anybody because I had thus many years of sobriety. And what would people say? What would people think? And I couldn't go see a doctor because I felt like that was a cop out. And um, <clears throat> so I was missing a lot of things. And I didn't know what it was, just like Bill talks about it, because I was doing act, I was active members, member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a home group, I had a sponsor, I had grand sponsor, I had sponsees that didn't stay long with me. Um, and what happened was when I was seven years sober and I was making a lot of money at this company I was working for, and uh the financially, I was doing well. I was doing very well. But um, I don't know if anybody experienced any of this, but uh, there's that part in 12 when Paul talks about when a uh, boy meets a girl in AA. Well, that kind of thing happened to me when I was 
uh, when I was uh, first year sober. And, and then we were just very unhappy after the marriage. And I stayed with marriage because I thought it was my duty. And I, I'm not going to get into his side because that has nothing to do with this, this thing. But uh, seven years sober, I was working 80 hours a week because I thought work was going to fix it. And, um, and I don't know what it was, but I knew I was missing, but I knew you guys had it. And at the same time, the marriage wasn't working out. So we were filing for a separation. He lived in one end of the house and I would lived in the other end of the house. We didn't even talk to each other. And um, at the same time, my sponsor, the one who took me through the steps, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And um, my, my world just fell apart. And I had a resentment list that was longer than the one that I came with. And, um, and everybody was stupid. <laughs> and Alcoholics Anonymous, whatever they said, didn't make any sense to me. And, um, and I tell you, there's a part in, um, in the big book where it talks about uh, the resentment part that um, it says that we uh, show them same pity and patience and tolerance like we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And um, I was so angry and I was so much enraged. My sponsor is dying of cancer and she's sick and I'm resentful at her and I couldn't cheerfully grant any of these things and she was more than a friend she was my sponsor she saved my life and I will be resentful at her because her hair is falling out and I have to carry her oxygen tank and she still wanted to go to stupid meetings. And I tell her, and I said, why would you want to go to these stupid meetings? They say the same thing all the time. They're stupid and they're leaving it. And, um, and they don't know how to quote the books and they, they butcher the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and blah, 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 blah. Uh, And um, so I will take her to these meetings. And I tell you what, and I think that is really what saved me from going out and drinking because I ended up in a hotel room three in the morning with seven years of sobriety with all these things, sponsor, sponsees, and a home group, and a, and a service job. And I ended up in a hotel room seven o'clock, I mean, three in the morning in a fetal position. And the thought came to me and what it said was, I don't want to be drunk. I don't want to be sober. I just want to check out. And I think that is, the, that is the same thing the vision for you talks about that for an alcoholic, we come to a point where we cannot imagine life with or without alcohol. We're jumping off place, we wish for the end. Um, I know I'm not quoting the book right, just like all those people I just, when I was uh, in AA, uh, but it's basically what it says. And, um, and I think that's what, that's what it is, jumping a place. For an alcoholic who cannot imagine life with alcohol, I mean, I don't know what that is. That's if that is in the bottom. That is, and that's where I was. And I think only reason I didn't drink or I didn't check out is because I felt I had a responsibility to take care of my sponsor until she passed. And, um, the, the cancer spread to her, uh, her brain, and she was saying funny things. But I'll tell you how, how strong Alcoholics Anonymous is because I had to uh, give her the medication. And if it was liquid med medicine, she will knock that out of my hand. And she said, I'm not drinking that. You're trying to kill me. And then all of a sudden she gets boost of energy. She walks out, she runs out of the house and she said, call 911, she's trying to kill me. And she associated that medicine with drinking. And, um, and I never forget that. And even when her brain was gone, 
And um, so how can we deny the power of God and power of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? And uh, what happened was, uh, is the, when I was, so my, when, when my uh, sponsor passed, I got to go to a woman's retreat in uh, Georgia and Polly, my current sponsor and Michael were doing the workshop. And my parents, both my mom and dad was on my, uh, they were on my uh, resentment list. They were like first people on the list and they were still on the list seven years later. And that's what, that's what, that's what happened. I was expecting them. I was demanding something from them that who were not. I was expecting something from them they were not capable of. And that resentment, because the, you know, the things that happened when I was, when I was young, you have no, you know, respect. Yeah, I, I, I may not when they beat, uh, beat me up all the time, you know, and I had bruises all over my body and I had to hide it every time I wanted to go to school. I may not have a part in that, but I have a part if I'm 30 some years old and wanting to kill myself and ruining my relationship with all these other people at the same time. And uh, Big Book doesn't even say a part. It says, uh, we look for our own mistake. Because I think it was, um, I heard it from Bob D from Las Vegas. He said, uh, if I have a part, then the other person has a part, right? And uh, uh, I'm an alcoholic. So the other person has a bigger part than my part. And as long as they have a bigger part, then I'll never be able to uh, get over this. I'll never be able to, and it says that we disregard other people involved entirely. Now this sounds like a resentment uh, workshop, but anyway, uh, so um, I went to the uh, uh, women's retreat and uh, Polly was talking to a woman who had a resentment against their mother. The parents have such a bad time in Alcoholics Anonymous anyway. Uh, I overheard Polly say, how did your mother grow up? And then I heard Michael, she was sharing her story. And the first thing out of her mouth after saying she's an alcoholic, she always says female alcoholic, but she said, before I tell you about my childhood, let me tell you about my mother's. And that hit me. You know, I was expecting all these things from other people, my sponsor and my parents and and my job trying to, I was like demanding things and not really knowing that's what I was doing. And as if there, it was gonna fill it. And I can't fill my fourth dimensional problem with three dimensional stuff. And that's what I was doing. I was doing it with my work. I was doing it with a friendship. I was doing it with my sponsor. I was doing it with my parents. And um, what happened was through that, I got to see, I was awake. I was awake a little bit and able to see. And it talks, he, Bill talks about St. Francis prayer. I begin to do those things. I remember a guy, there was a guy in my uh, old home group in Jacksonville, Florida, used to say, if you don't know what God's will is and you don't know what to do, do St. Francis prayer, which made a lot of sense. So I begin to understand before I was understood. I begin to love before I was loved. And I begin to comfort before I was comforted without really expecting anything. I didn't want any apologies from my parents. I didn't have I, none of that because I always had that. I was victimized by all that stuff, you know? And, um, <laughs> and, and what happened was I was able to basically eight and, and step nine came in, you know, be able to make amends, to make things right, to forgive. And when that happened, when the attachment to that was gone, when the demand was gone, I was able to let go. You know, because it's the, when, when we attach to, attach to things, when we demand things, it's always right here in our face, you know? And, and that's when I realized, my God, that's what they mean when they say, let go and let God. 
You know, I'm like, how do you do that? How do you do that? Because it sounds so like, it's not easy, but like, what do you mean? Like, what am I doing wrong? You know, I'm doing all these things. I'm doing all the six and seven. And um, because spiritual world doesn't have demands, you know, it doesn't have conditions. And it talks about, Bill talked about it in the, in the article, adult love. What does that look like? I didn't know. I didn't know, you know, and I was always, I was always wanting, and sometimes we, we say it behind the podium, people tell their story. They say, um, and I know what they mean, but what they say is this, that I, I, we supposed to disclose our story in general way what we used to be like, but I often hear what it was like, what happened, what it is like now. But that's not what the book says. It says what we were like, what happened and what we are like now. Because if I still expecting it to change, I probably won't be sober today. And, um, and I was able to do that work. I had expected nothing from my parents. I didn't want to Paul. I didn't even like expect anything. But this is what happens in a spiritual world. And that's something that you don't even expect that you don't even want anymore because finally I'm free. I'm free to love and it's okay, you know? In 2009, I went to see my parents and um, they live in Korea still. They're not doing well right now. But my, one of the last days I was there, my mom was uh, sitting on the, uh, on the floor doing her laundry or something. So um, I was rubbing her back and she looked so tired and so old. And um, I thought about her childhood. She was horribly abused. And I even thought about her adulthood because I watched my mother who can shed single tear when her mother died, when her father died, when her only sibling died. But I remember she sat for me when I was six months over, hugging my sponsor, who is dead now. And um, she said, thank you for saving my daughter's life. And um, so when I was rubbing her, she said, I said, mom, you look so tired. And she turned around and she took my hand and she said, uh, you know, I'm not proud of a lot of things I've done in my life, but what I regret most is how I treated you in the moment. It wasn't something I didn't even expect and I didn't demand, but it just came. And she, she said that to me. And the moment she said that, I knew that I was forgiven for things I've done and forgiven for the person I became through alcoholism, that my soul that I sold for all those drinks, it was as if little piece of it came back. And um, I've been reading this book and it talks about spiritual rewards are inherent. That means it's pre-existing. It was there all along. I just didn't know it. And you know, our friend Bob from Minnesota always talks about that. He said, find what you already have, right? And um, that's what happens in, in alcohol sense because Nothing is waste in fourth dimension. Bill said it in one of those essays. He says, in God's economy, nothing's wasted. And, um, and you would think my life would have been great and grand. <laughs> but I still want those three-dimensional things to fill me, you know? And because it's a continuous thing. It's, it's like one of those self-centeredness. And Polly, my sponsor, always says, depression is the highest form of self-centeredness. What you're doing is all you're doing is you're thinking about yourself. And I'm not talking about the medically, uh, you know, uh, diagnosed depression. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about my kind of depression, which is self-pity and often comes out as anger and often comes out as, you know, a judgment and criticism and all that stuff and pride. Um, and I thought I got even more involved in Alcoholics Anonymous after that, I was in, I was doing, I was involved in the, uh, in the state conventions and all this stuff. And I was doing this and I was doing that and blah, blah, blah. Um, And I was having really good time, not knowing 
that I'm still expecting three dimensional stuff to fill my fourth dimensional problem or fix. And um, when I was around 20 years over, and I don't really like to talk about this, and I don't know why I'm talking about it now, because I am embarrassed and I'm shamed. Um, because Jim, my current husband, we had a, a we bought this house in the worst time in re real estate, uh, and we lost a lot of money on that. And by this time, I was out speaking at conferences and stuff like that. And uh, I didn't want to go. I, I didn't want to go. Because, you know, how could I talk about, you know, being an example of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, if I ruin my finance? Um, I remember having a nervous breakdown. I had to fly somewhere and uh, I called Polly at the airport and I just sobbed. Because I didn't want to get on the plane and um, I didn't want to face anybody. And um, she, she keeps saying, honey, I had to file bankruptcy. Trust me, there's life after bankruptcy. And um, I could hear her say that to this day, but it wasn't happening to her now. So I was like, oh my God, you know, but I, um, I made myself go. And the only reason I did that is because I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to disappoint people at the conference or people that knew me or people who recommended me to that conference. You know, I didn't want the, uh, because Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life. So do I always cheerfully do these things? No, I don't. That's, I mean, I'm being honest, I don't. I mean, especially when people from West Coast call me, I'm like, my God, that's like midnight here. You want me to talk for an hour at midnight? Um, but that's just, you know, again, you know, self-centeredness, the pride, you know? How, 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 do you, how, do you, how do you pay back what I was freely given? You know, do I still demand these things? Yeah. I don't notice it at times. And sometimes I have to hit emotional bottom with those defects. You know, if, uh, if my friend comes up to me, supposedly one of my best friends comes up to me with tears running down her face and say things like, there's no way I'll share this with you because I know you're going to judge me. Even after 20 years. What am I doing? You know, what kind of person does that? What kind of person get mad at somebody who's dying of cancer who saved your life just because she, she wants you to take her to stupid AA meetings? What kind of person does that? You know, and so I'm so glad that Bill Wilson talked about this because I could talk about it, right? Like, I, I, yeah, am I embarrassed to talk about it a lot of times? Yeah, I mean, who wants to, you know, let it all hang out out there. The people you don't even know, you know, some of the people on here, I don't even know. Some, a lot of, you know, me, I know though. Um, and, but the point is that we get to talk about this and we get to walk this together, you know, because um, in, in God's world, we are all worth it, right? Um, I, I've been reading this book. I've been reading like two different books. I don't know which one it came from, but um, it talk about it talks about that you know a lot of times we we struggle with who are who are we? What is our identity? Who am I? You know, a lot of times the new new people say, "I don't know who I am," and I just say, "You're just not alcoholic." That's it. Um, but in in this book, it talks about that we all have identity and then we should never forget it is a divine one that every one of us is God's child. And um, so I go back to, you know, what Chuck Chambly talked about in his, um, well, it was, a, a, I guess, a men's retreat. He talked about that new pair of glasses, you know, he always talks about, you know, wh what can I do for God's kids today? You know, and that we should do it for fun and for free. And um, <clears throat> so 
we go through small, sometimes big struggles up and down. But as long as I stay with you, I know that I'm going to be okay. So I'm just going to end with that. And thank you for having me. Kyle, was beautiful. Thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed you the first time I heard you and I really, really enjoyed you tonight. It's funny trying to describe kind of people who haven't come to this, uh, who we asked to moderate it, what exactly they're supposed to do, you know, but usually it just comes out, you know, so I just always tell people, hey, just get started, have fun with it and let the spirit move you, you know, and it's, it's been really cool for a bunch of people. I, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Yeah, I, um, I called you earlier. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. What am I supposed to do? What does moderate yeah. mean? <laughs> oh yeah, I had a guy. I had a guy call me a little while ago. He's like, "What exactly is it that you want? I I need you to be real clear. What exactly you want? Do you want me to tell my AA story, or do you want me to? I mean, what is it that you want? I'll do it. I just need to know exactly what you want, Sam. I was like, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> just go there and have fun. Uh, so I need, so you get to call on, uh, the way we usually do this is I, I let you call on two or three people and then we just open it up. Look through the Hollywood squares, you know, somebody, right? You're going to have to help me with that. Um, All right. is, do people get to raise their hand or? Do, oh yeah. Well, so you call on somebody, uh, that, you know, here, or, you know, somebody you feel like calling on. Well, I know Scroll Steve Lee's on here. <laughs> yeah. Call on Steve then. Tell him to get on with it. Steve, you hear? <laughs> yeah. Hey, good evening, everyone. Steve, alcoholic. Up, and man? hello, Masoon. And uh, always, uh, uh, Sammy gave me a heads up that you were going to be here tonight, so I didn't want to miss. Uh, you know I love you. And uh, uh, appreciate, uh, like Sam said, what happens is we start talking and the heart takes over. And that's always the most important uh, thing that we have to share with each other is the truth about ourselves. And what I always respect and appreciate is your willingness uh, uh, to stand in front of the things that are going on recently, not always a long time ago. You know, it, I think the easiest things I do is tell you about stuff 30 years ago, but uh, Tuesday is pretty embarrassing for me as well. And sometimes I'm not as quick to put that on the table. And I appreciate that you are willing to do that. You know, you said that you talked about more in, in the not too distant past, uh, going through that uh, financial embarrassment, if you will, and not wanting to get on that plane and not wanting to stand in front of people and and what Polly shared with you. And, and you know, it's so, I see a few of, of my friends from the Richmond, Virginia area on here. And uh, a guy named Joe Sullivan was my sponsor when I was in Richmond back in the, in the nineties. And, uh, I had to file bankruptcy and I'd moved back to Nashville, but Joe sent me a letter. There was an email then. He sent a letter and he had cut out a uh, newspaper clipping and the clipping said, uh, showed that there were something like 12 million bankruptcies in the U.S. that year. And he just had a little handwritten note that said, see, you're not the only dumbass." And, uh, uh, I took great comfort in that. And, uh, uh, Say, and, and I have survived it as well. So, but I appreciate you uh, sharing with us tonight. It's always great to see you. Thanks for calling on. Thanks, thank Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. Um, let's see. I know Matt worked from uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Would you like Matt. to share? Oh, oh, man. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just like really moving to hear. Uh, the way you share, um, and uh, it's uh, so it's a, it's a privilege. Yeah, and I enjoy seeing your work. And I, I remember I heard a I think I heard a talk you gave in State Line. I think someone like had a had like like a a cardiac event while you were talking. <laughs> it was quite a quite a production. Mike was telling me all about it. But anyways, um, thanks so much. It really it, it, you know touched me. Uh, just like Steve said, this stuff in the present uh, that's real and uh, pervasive um, and persistent and requires a lot of uh, you know, con contact with you guys, um, work with other people, a sponsor, um, all of those things that um, 
you know, bring healing and a power greater to direct my, my life and help me see what I have, because this, this thing that, that we have in common, um, you know, I can really lose sight of what I have. It's just, it's just the most bizarre thing. Um, but somehow working with you guys, I get to, I get to see what the reality is. And, uh, but you reminded me of something Masoon, and I'll share this and then I'll shut up. But I, I have been, um, you know, working with Gary and having a home group and, and, and Mike and just, you know, doing this thing. And I think my, my dad, when I first got, uh, when I was young, he drank alcoholically. <clears throat> so when I got sober, I was really angry at him. And then he seemed to kind of straighten out a little bit. And then my mom and dad got divorced. When I'm well into sobriety, my mom started drinking herself to death. And I gave her some really great first step pitches. And I think, uh, you know, I was talking, I was complaining to my dad uh, about my mom drinking herself to death. You know, I don't think that's in the big book. That's what I was doing. And uh, he said to me, he said, uh, you know, you're the one who taught me about unconditional love. And I went, I, and I, you know, it was like, I still just, it makes the hair stand up because, you know, that's God and that's AA. And, uh, and he really, it, it really helped me see, you know, gosh, she just has what I have and what can I do to love her and, and try and be helpful to her. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I really thank you so much. That's all I have. Good to meet you. Thank you. Um, how about Don Elf from Richmond, Virginia? Hi, Ms. Soon. It's glad to meet you. I've been looking, I've been watching your work online since I was down in Sarasota and it's fantastic. But I could look at that all day and uh, that, you know, would not match this talk. I mean, it, the, the heart that you put forward for us is, I felt it. I mean, it hit me. So I, uh, the thing that just popped for me was what you said, I can't feel my fourth dimensional a fourth dimensional power with three dimensional stuff. And um, to me, there was like, that is such a nice little catchy way of talking about how I am trying to feel, get these, my attachments become demands and they completely cut me off from the sunlight of the spirit. And um, I like the fact that you talk about all the other stuff that you're reading. And um, I've been reading uh, some stuff in a book study about with Emmett Fox, reading Emmett Fox. And um, one of the things I was picking up on this week is that my duty as a person who um, wants to be open to that adult love that just talks about, it's becoming a thing that I'm beginning to understand. Like I'm beginning to understand what that means that when I'm cut off from the spirit, I cannot have compassion. I cannot have a real tolerance. I cannot have kindness. I can't transmit that to anybody when I'm cut off from it because of myself, I'm nothing. And the, um, the, what I've keyed into in just this week, you know, I like what Steve said on Tuesday is that, um, my real responsibility is to park myself in a chair in the morning and say, okay, what today? As opposed to my things that I think are gonna make me work fundamentally better in the world. And, um, and that one of the things that I read in the uh, Emmett Fox thing is that when I do this, there must be a demonstration. And for the longest time, I thought the demonstration came from me. And this week, I realized that the must of the demonstration comes from that power, which is God, which is able to move through me. And that the must is that this is going to happen. Step aside, Dawn. I am empowering you to be useful for me. And I love what you said is I cannot put three dimensional things in that space to fulfill me. 
And in actuality, what they do is they block the channel. So, um, wow, what a talk. I love the thing you said. I, it really brought, hit my heart when you said that the woman talked about her mother's experience first. You know, my mother shared her story with me and it explained a lot. It explained a lot. And um, I, I think I'll call my mom tomorrow because of what you shared. Thank you. Okay. Um, gosh, I know a lot of people on here actually. Um, how about Tom, since they hit him out? This Tom? Yeah, that Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Sue. My name's Tom. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it is so funny. You know, uh, I just, uh, I don't really have much to share. I, I, um, I was the one who kept pushing to have you on this. And uh, Sam finally acquiesced. And then I said, uh, well, you know, you better get Polly too, because she'll probably hear that Masoon was on this, you know. And, um, but, you know, it's, I just said to Juanita, I said, you know, when Masoon talks, it's never a can talk. Like she's reliving that stuff. She's right there with it, you know, and you can tell. And you know, if some of us who have done this a while, you you can tell, you know, and uh, and it takes a lot. I mean, that costs you to do that. And I really appreciate that too. I really, really do. And uh, I was there when Matt was talking about, I just said to Juanita, I said, do you remember Masoon was talking and some cat had a heart attack, like right down in front of her and she just soldiered on through the top. <laughs> You know, it was great. It's what we do in AA, you know, and they picked the guy up and they took care of him. He was okay, I guess. I mean, you know, there was nothing you could have done for him, but uh, that was pretty dramatic, you know. I love you a lot. I really respect you and, and thanks so much for coming on this, Masoon. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I haven't seen Mary for a long time. Hi, Mary. Hey. Hi there. So good to hear you tonight. Really good to hear you. So it's terrible. We live that we're close enough together. We just we're so quarantined. Anyway, um, my name is Mary Theram, an alcoholic. Uh, I too have to quote Tom and say that's right. It's about third or fourth time I've listened to you, and each time it's like I get to see another layer removed and uh, and more of your soul exposed is about what I feel from you and. And uh, like, um, you know, the minute you said that about the um, fourth dimension can't be filled with the third dimension, Dawn's texting me, what do you think of this? And <laughs> so so she, as she said, I said, yeah, that's exactly uh, the truth. I remember hearing Chuck Chamberlain say something um, to that. In fact, he said, you know, did you ever notice that everything grows from the inside out. It's only the human being trying to get something outside to put into them to make them feel better. And it's, it just doesn't work that way. And um, not that there's anything wrong with uh, the third dimension or money, property and prestige, nothing wrong with it. But if it, it's, the, it's the main goal, um, it's out of whack. It's just out of whack for me. Uh, the, a couple of things that I resonated with you uh, tonight in talking was um, this um, seventh year, I think you said you were in the fetal position and, um, and you had this enormous surrender. And I had that happen to me. And it, it, uh, when, when I experienced it, I experienced this feeling um, that they used to say all the time that God is spelled R-I-S-K. And, and, and when I was in the fetal position with no place to go, because my mind had brought me exactly as far as I could go, there was this strange surrender. And it was almost like what the book said, it says we surrender, um, self will run riot. So there's a surrender to alcohol, but then there's this surrender to my self will run riot that goes on for the rest of my recovery. Um, and because I don't even know where I'm agnostic until I run into myself in some area of my life and why so much um, um, deals with uh, the, uh, the willingness, if you will, or the humbleness or whatever it is 
that draws me to pick up this simple kit of spiritual tools one more time. Uh, recently, I was just reading something, probably everybody knows this, but it, it triggered something in me because it kind of laid out what, had ha what has happened to me. Um, I, I wasn't raised with any God. I mean, I wasn't raised to say that you were stupid if you believed in God. I just, the God was money, property, and prestige, and it wasn't, wasn't a church type thing. And so throughout the years, I've often heard when anybody starts to talk about, you know, everybody says this is a spiritual program, not religious, but spiritual. And yet every time when we get to the second step, I usually hear people tell me all about their religion. And, and I, you know, I've always been fascinated with that. And somebody wrote something the other day, you know, you read these things and it says, the second step says that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves would restore us to sanity, which is sound thinking and balance. And many areas of my life, I've never had any. And it doesn't say that we came to believe in a power. It says that a power. And you know, that somehow shifted me completely because I realized that was the truth. I knew, like you probably knew with your sponsors and the people you met, I mean, you know, Chuck Chamberlain, Stockham, when I'm there, I knew that there was some kind of a power that was going on here. But my recovery has been about how I have come to believe in that power. It, it was just a shift for me. It allowed me to pick up a tool. And it was like, I didn't, I, I remember um, this fellow I went with, he said, you know, you're not supposed to make any major decisions in the first year and believing in something could be a major decision. And so we used to laugh about that and so forth. But uh, the truth is, um, as I've grown and I've had those fetal positions and surrenders and at 20 years, you've heard my talk at 20 years, I, all my belief structure started to get shattered. And I realized that I had intellectually done this program and I kept people away with my intellect about the black lines and so forth. And the last 27 years, I've been trying to live it. And there's a big difference in that. It's just a big difference in that. It's more heartfelt and it's very vulnerable. And um, it's very, I'm just blessed to hear people like yourself and I'm not running along this road all by myself. Lovely to see you, sweetie, love you. Give my love to Polly. Okay. Um. <clears throat> How about Gary B? There you go, Gary. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Soon. Uh, I, it looks to me like I might be the only one sitting here that didn't know who you were till I heard this just now. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, I got, I got a, a text from Tom. To, tell me that Polly was her sponsor. And I said, well, that's great. At least she's got some good leadership. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, I guess I'm in love with you now. I think that was just a, a, such a heartfelt talk and it was from a depth that we don't often hear in AA. And, and, uh, and I'm just delighted. It's just, it's just been wonderful that I was here. I don't have much else to say, but uh, thank you so very much. We can open it up if you guys want. We'll, uh, okay. Anybody raise their hand? Yeah, we can just put raised hands. So, so raise your hand if you want to share. Oh, there we go. Sarah uh, H. Hi, everyone. Sarah, alcoholic. Ms. Soon, thank you so much. I, I heard you at the Women's International a few years back, and, um, and I fell in love with you there, and I just fell in love with you again tonight. It was so good to hear you again. Um, I, I've really loved, and very simply, you know, what you said about um, the part of the book where it says what we were like, what happened, and what we are like to, um, now, our stories disclosed in a general way. Um, I, it, I kept hearing people say it, and I kept thinking it doesn't say it. It says we. 
And so I had to, I had to analyze that a little bit for myself and discovered that um, it, when I say it, it takes me out of the equation. It, I have to say it we, I have to look at we, because that's the only way that I'm a part of that, um, that we're a part of that. When we say it, again, it takes us out of the equation and we're not a part of that. And, um, and, and, I, and I think you said something about the resentment, as long as we have, um, have them, the other person has a bigger part, then we will never get over it. Thank you for that. Um, I've been working with a sponsee who who's having some trouble getting over some of those resentments and and that's the exact words that I, I that will help me to help her so thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here tonight thank you so much for your share um kathy a hi i'm kathy an alcoholic i'm assuming that was just a beautiful talk I just, I'm so touched by your honesty because we don't, and like everybody said, we don't always hear that part of people's story. And um, except that when I started opening up at 20 years, I got to hear like the stories of people just went so much deeper because it seems like, I don't know, we go along in the program and we think we're working it. And at 20 years, all of a sudden, it's like, I don't even know who this person is. I found a new sponsor and I sat on her couch at 19 years with my coat still on, huddled at the other side of the couch. And it was like, I could not open up. And it was like, you know, this is, <laughs> I'm, I'm not new. You know, I have a lot of time, but, you know, to open up and this person, the sponsor was just so special because she had the patience to sit there and listen to me. But, you know, it was a bottom. I ended up in the hospital for like the, the second time. I couldn't figure out why. It's like, what's going on? And, um, you know, and you explained it, you know, so well that we just, we come to the end of ourselves and you know, my God looks different after that time. And you talked about that too. You know, God just shows up different. Um, you know, I think one of the, when you said, so the other part, you know, same as the person who spoke before me, you know, the difference between it and we, and because it takes us out of the equation. The thing that I figured out this week, because I, I just had so much fear coming up, that, um, you know, I, my three o'clock writing in my journal, you know, I can't write when it's in the middle of the day, but, um, you know, about fear and, you know, fear is an emotion, like afraid is not who I am, which is just, it was just like such a big awakening. It's like, no, fear is an emotion and it doesn't, it's not a part of my care, you know, it's not who I am. I mean, like I wouldn't introduce myself as afraid, but it just, it took it from being outside of myself to being inside of myself. And it's just an emotion. And I felt that with the two different words between it and we, because sometimes it takes us out of the equation and we don't keep the knowing inside of ourselves long enough to figure out what's going on. So thank you for your story. Thank you for your sobriety. I just appreciate your share. Thank you. Let's see, we need to get some more people raising their hands. Otherwise, I'm just gonna have to start picking on people. Um, what about Liz H? She's getting picked on right now. <laughs> yeah. What are you up to, Liz? Hi, I'm Liz, I'm an alcoholic. Liz? I'm on the spot, so give me a second. Um, all right. So I, Masoon, I also am in love with you now. Um, I really, really appreciate, I'm so glad to have heard you. And um, you know what you said, I can't fill my fourth dimension hole with third dimension stuff. I wrote that in, car in a crayon, because that's all I have. My daughter just handed me a crayon. Um, on the 
10th step book that Tom sent me. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think, you know, I'm kind of not emotionally together right now, honestly. And I, and I'm as uncomfortable as, as that is, I'm grateful for it, if that makes any sense at all, because I'm only three and a half years in the program. Um, and I think, you know, I got sober and had such an intense experience um, awakening spiritually. I mean, I fell in love with God really. And for the first year, um, it was great. I just, it was like, I, I had no idea who I was my entire life. And then I destroyed it. And then I finally had, um, you know, asked God, who am I? And God started to tell me who I'm, who, who, who he made me to be. And I got to feel that I got to feel like that person. Cause I was doing all the things that you guys told me to do. Um, but, and then, you know, after a while stuff, life started getting in the way and I'm just kind of at a point in my sobriety where the difference between showing up at a meeting, which I'm good at saying all the right things, which I've done my whole life and really being willing and really getting to that second surrender or the beginning of it. I don't know where I'm really willing to just unhinge it and, and, and live my life without my soul all clenched up, you know, because I want to be useful and everybody in my life, um, you know, there's so much, uh, so much addiction and I desperately want to be helpful to these people. And I'm just at the point where I acknowledge I can't help anybody, but I absolutely believe that God can and will. And so I just, I feel like I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit real with the fact that every, everything is God. God is the best in me and in everyone else. And that that is my primary purpose and all the other shit is, is nothing in comparison to that. It's third dimension versus fourth dimension. And I'm learning to trust, or at least like Mary said, I'm learning I'm acknowledging that that is the solution really to my alcoholism. Um, Cause I got to get that. I, I want to let that alcoholism go. Um, you know, but when I got sober and then you guys taught me all kinds of really great stuff, there's a part of me that thought I was going to use all that stuff to fix everything. And I know I can't only God can. So I'm trying to let go a little bit and I'm not at all comfortable with being really vulnerable, but I believe, especially after hearing you speak there, it's just another re like affirming to me that what I want is vulnerability. And what I want is absolute surrender and ask God, just come with me everywhere. Do everything with me. Cause you're the, you're the thing that makes a difference, not me. And, um, and that's great. You know, that's, this is the secret to life. I feel. This is, this is the thing that makes a difference really. Um, and I want to take a back seat to that. And uh, I just feel incredibly spoiled by God with all of you guys. So thank you. Great share. We have uh, Fernando. Hey man. Hi, Hi my name is Fernando, I'm an alcoholic. Hey man. Masoon, great to hear you. Uh, you had me laughing, and then you had me at tears, you know. Um, I kind of got, I went through it today. I had a moment, and I need to speak, I need to talk about it, because I've always held it in and not talked about it. And, um, you know, it, beautiful day, not a cloud on the horizon. Um, we're doing my book, book reading. And next thing I know, I get a phone call from my son saying he uh, he hurt himself on a skateboard accident. Nothing crazy. Take him to the doctor, uh, have his arm checked. Take him to the second doctor, x-ray doctor, and have his arm checked again. By the third doctor, it's already getting five o'clock um, West Coast time. You know, um, 
They couldn't get him in and they're freaking out about his insurance, whether he had insurance or not. And I, here I am freaking out and I'm going through it. And I go, just like a vision for you, I went to that moment where I made all these phone calls. I called Tom, I called Kurt, I called my sponsor. Uh, I almost called Mary, I called Gary and he picked up and you know what these i'm very thankful for all of you guys for picking up because it's not that i'm gonna drink over it but it's it had me you know what it shot me back to when i was 10 years old and looking for my dad and there's no dad there and you know it's oh wow I was reminded of this meeting about emotional sobriety and I didn't want to lose it. I didn't want to lose it for my kid. I didn't want to lose it for my wife. But so, and, and, and Gary, you, he said it for me, you know, I just reached up to God and I just said, I said that little prayer, God, please help me. Please help me with this, this, this situation. And it was okay 10 minutes later, but when I was going through it, you know, I can practice all of this big book and all this 12 and 12, but when life hits, that's what, that's the real deal for me. You know, um, like Popeye says, I am what I am. I don't know what I am. I'm still learning who I am. I'm still learning to find my voice in AA, you know, and I'm trying to do that right here. Oh, but I'm so grateful for this meeting, Sam, because that's all I can think about after the phone call, what I'm going to get on the meeting. And then Kurt called and then he was able to talk me off that ledge some more because all I can think about was, not to react on people and not to take out my anger and my frustration on other people because it's not fair for what I'm going through. And to just suit up and show up and be here tonight and to hear you, Masu, and thank you for your share. But to see everybody else on the Hollywood squares, it's just that's that makes my night night because you know what? I know that it's going to be okay. And I know that my son's taking care of God's watching him. He'll take care of him. But it's me that I wasn't sure of. It was me. And today I know that he has me now. Right here and now, I know he's got me. So thank you. Thank you. What about my dude, Aaron? What about Aaron H? There he is. Hair's growing out looking good, man. Looking good. Yeah, yeah. That's what you call it, you know? Uh, <clears throat> nah, but uh, Aaron, alcoholic, man. Uh, Thanks for, I knew when I texted you, I was going to get called on right after I sent it. I was like, damn, I was like, here it comes. Uh, put you fresh on the mind, but <laughs> um, not nah, just uh, pretty much what everyone else said. I miss Masoon, you know, just a uh, uh, phenomenal talk. You know, it's been a long day. It's funny. My mother's in town and uh, I don't know if she just thinks I don't do anything with like my wife and my kids, but anytime she's here and I have to do something, she's like, oh, Aaron, you don't need to, you know, do that. You need to be here with and uh, I told her I had to come upstairs and get on the talk. And, and she was giving me that spiel. I was like, this is, you know, AA sponsor. I was like, you know what happens when I when we don't do this, right? She's like, yeah, you can get on up there, uh, handle your business. But uh, I'm glad I did because uh, that was a great talk. Um, and, you know, it's just I, I feel everyone's brought it up. And I love the, uh, you know, can't solve or, you know, what I'm saying can't solve third, the third dimensional stuff uh, or fourth dimensional stuff with third dimensional stuff. Uh, I know I butchered the hell out of that, but. I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about because they've all brought it up. Um, but that was just my MO, you know, my mind. I, I remember being as, as young as I can remember, I don't know, kindergarten or maybe even before that. And I always just had this idea. I'd have people uh, that I would idolize and lives that I would idolize. And I'd always think like, if I could just get this pair of tennis shoes, like life will finally be okay. Um, and that, that, uh, that, that kind of goal started, you know, um getting more sophisticated you know and then it became like you know like sports teams and money and relationships and I just always just had this idea like once this had if I get this and these people over here notice me for having this then like then I'll finally I'll be okay I'll be okay with me everyone will recognize that um and I just set out uh that's a real primitive way to put it um, but I would set out to do that. And, uh, if I would get those things, I mean, it not only did it not help, it's almost like it made the problem worse. I heard this guy say, he goes, you know, throwing things in that hole doesn't help at all. He goes, in fact, all it does is make the hole bigger. Um, 
And I always joke about it, you know, when I come into AA and everyone knows that it's not original, but you know, the things that um, we're told to do in here are so counterintuitive uh, given the problem. Like someone will come in and say, man, I, I got, you know, I'm facing three felonies next month in court. And like, you know, I'm behind on child support and like, you know, no, I have no friends and they'll say, you need to get to the meeting early and talk to the guy that is picking up a silver chip. And it's like, you must not have heard me dog. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I need some, I need an attorney. I, I need like some real counsel here. And, and, uh, and they just kind of shake their heads at you. And, and, and that person walks away like these people are, I don't know if they're slow or if they didn't hear, if I'm not, you know, enunciating properly, but uh, they just don't get it. And the people that take the spiritual actions, all the worldly stuff just starts to work out. Um, one of my favorite things that was touched on, I can't even remember who said it or where, but um, where the, the A, Bs and Cs and the B, you know, that um, probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And I heard this guy one time, he did it really well but he goes man I, I think of all the human powers I did like the education you know he goes I've read books you know this and that didn't work he goes psychiatry you know and, and I'm not knocking that I'm a big fan of you know uh all that but he goes that didn't work he goes falling in love that didn't work he goes I, I had some penitentiary time on the shelf through the courts fear constant that didn't ha and he goes through all these moving you know Roman you know everything that didn't work and uh he cross-referenced it to the um in the, the part in We Agnostics talks about, you know, God was there, you know, he was there the whole time. It says it's only in the last analysis that he could be found. And he said, it's the last place I looked and first thing that worked. Um, and I'm just so grateful. Uh, you know, Sam's my sponsor. He, he can, he knows better than anybody, but um, I'm, I'm just so grateful that I had all the, you know, just enough fight beat out to me. You know, I didn't think this was going to work. I thought this was so corny. I just thought my life living in a halfway house and cleaning up other people's coffee spills, as long as I didn't go back to penitentiary or something like that, like, and I could get a paycheck for $340 from Blue Coast Burrito, like that was going to be horrible, but it was better than the alternative. And I had no idea what was really waiting for me on the other side. I'm just so grateful for people like y'all in this meeting. And um, I don't know, just I'm happy to be here tonight. So thank you again for sharing. Thank you everybody else who spoke. And uh, Sambo, thanks for calling on me and uh, doing what you do for me and so many. Love you guys. That's it. Thank you, man. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, let's see here. We got any hands raised? All right, it makes it so difficult. Nobody ever wants to share on this thing. What about uh, Connie and Steven? I see them looking intently. What's going on? How are you guys? Thanks for coming to our meeting. Want to share one of you? Well, everyone, I'm Steven. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, Ms. Soon, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I've always found it difficult to articulate to some people when, when, I, when I'm trying to say, they ask me how I'm doing and, I, and I'm, I'm really kind of reserved and introverted person. And I want to say, if I, could, if I could bring you into my fourth dimension and not have to tell you how I'm doing and just be able to show you how I'm doing. And, and I can't do that. What, and, and typically what happens is most people don't have to ask me how I'm doing. They can just look at me and see how I'm doing. And sadly, the majority of the time is I'm, I'm dealing with third dimension things. I'm, I'm responding and reacting to the third dimension things. Uh, but there's this weird detachment that I know I have spiritually, and that is it's almost as if that's just part of my human job is that I have to go tend to these things and I, and I can't be unkind to people along the way. And, um, but I'm super comforted in this fourth dimension place that I found. And, and I appreciate what I just heard someone else say about it. It's, it seems so counterintuitive to just take the spiritual action from someone who has done it before me. And then, and then, be gifted with this opportunity to be in a living in a fourth dimension spiritually and feel uh, safe and protected at all times, um, no matter what is going on. Um, it's almost like I'm detached from it uh, in, in a day's time and I'm, I'm going about my business and doing my job and dealing with personal relations and uh, all these things that were mentioned tonight. You know, I, I'm only, I'm so, I'm so new at how to do this the right way that every day is an opportunity for me to learn how to, how to show up a little bit better each day. And uh, 
I, I, I was, I'm very familiar with the way you identified yourself and what your alcoholism looked like because I was the same way. I, I had, I could only identify one emotion. It was anger. And that was a result of fear, which, you know, it was always, it was resentment. And uh, I remember doing a, I remember doing my fourth step this time and writing down for, the, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time I had done a four step. And in that first column, I wrote my dad down and he, he made every one of those four steps. And this last one I did that reality, that, that fourth dimension of seeing it was like, holy crap, I'm now his age and I have children at the age that I was resenting him for the way he was treating me and his alcoholism. And I know I'm, I'm doing the best that I can now. And it was that moment, it was that light bulb I realized, you know, I can't go on treating other people that I come across in a day's time uh, inappropriately or unkindly because of the way I felt I was treated. Uh, and, and being free from that and, and being able to identify that uh, and, and show up differently today, it's, it's a challenge. Thank God for people in my life that I can call and say, man, I don't, I don't think I did too good here. This is what, this is what happened. What, what could I have done better or, or better yet before I take any action, call somebody and say, these are my circumstances. What, what am I going to do? Cause left to my own devices, I don't feel like I, I can have that unconditional love and, and tolerance that I'm supposed to have because I'm, I'm too busy operating in a world of three dimensions where that doesn't exist too well. And uh, so I just want to say thank you for your talk tonight and thanks for having me on this meeting. What about uh, our friend Veronica from New Mexico? Let's see if I can pick on. Sorry, that. unmute myself. Yep, got it. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Veronica, and I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for calling on me, Sam. It's like thanks for calling on me, Sam. Masoon, you know what? I didn't know who you were. I do now, and uh, I'm listening to what you're saying. And I'm like, where have you been all my life? I know that sounds a bit corny, but it's, uh, you really, I was laughing at the beginning. I was crying, you know, in the middle and the end. And I really related a lot to what you had to say. Thank you so much. Um, I also, I'm at four years now. I find that uh, my fear list when I came in was longer than my resentment list. And I was just saying to my sponsor a little while ago, something not right here. My resentment list is getting is getting longer. It's not getting shorter. So you know that's uh, that's what I've been um, that's what I've been experiencing. I am so touched the way you spoke about your mum. My uh, my first fourth step inventory. I had all the biggies on there, family, mother, father, brother, a couple of other, uh, a couple of other highlights. Um, and it took me a while and I don't think I'm yet thoroughly through it. But when I started to, and I was, I was very fortunate that it was suggested to me to go through the process of writing my, my mother's story. And um, it was horrific. And something shifted. And I just, I was truly able to see that she did the best that she could, as did my dad. What I've been through in my life isn't even a touch on what uh, especially my mother has been through. And um, and I won't go into to details, just I don't want to take up the time. It's not the, it's not the place right now. Um, what it's been able to afford me to do is as my expectations, as my judgments, as my belief systems are altered, I'm now able to give back to my mum as her dementia is escalating, the care and love that is required for however much 
time she has left. Now, that is not the person that I was four years ago, without a doubt. And um, just, I think that's it. Thank you so much. It was really, it was really something. Thank you. Thank you so much. What about uh, Belinda C, my friend Belinda? Hey, Sam. Thanks. I'm Belinda Malcolic. Um, let's see. Thank you. Uh, one thing you were talking about, uh, we were talking about depression and not clinical depression, but um, it's been a rough time. And it was weird last night because I usually don't um, look at Facebook till about the middle of the night. And um, I have a cousin that I've only seen. I mean, I don't think I've seen him in 20 something years and lives in Arizona. And uh, I don't know, he, he wanted to chat on Messenger. And I guess he'd seen on Facebook, but um, my husband had died and he said, um, how are you? And I was like, tired. <laughs> this was about two o'clock. And he said, no, I mean, how are you? And I, and I said, well, I'm okay. I said, sometimes it's rough, but, and he just stopped, he just interrupted me and goes, why are you saying that? I was like, he said, what are you talking about? He said, hardly anyone in this age has had as much time as you had together. He said, you had almost 50 years. It wasn't quite 50 years, but you had almost 50 years together. He said, you have had a beautiful life. You, you guys saw the moon, you've seen the stars, you've seen the bottom of the sea. Um, people just don't have that. People don't live like that. People don't have each other like that. Um, why in the world would you be sad? And I just thought, I mean, he's definitely not proud of him, but, um, I just thought it was really interesting that he would just call me in the middle of the night and start in on me all day. Um, but one thing before that happened, I just happened to be going, it's just the weird ways that things happen. Um, I just happened to be going through a box of my father's uh, outlines and notes to sermons. And he died when I was 11. And I'd never been able to read them. And I was, I just had, there was a shoebox full of them. And I was just going through the closet. I was supposed to be doing something else, but distracted as usual. And I pulled this box out and um, I picked up a stack, moved it and picked up one. And for some reason started looking at it. Well, to backtrack what was going on, I was not happy with the hospice people mainly because they weren't giving me, I mean, they were not telling me what I wanted to hear. And then also I was having, uh, needing to accept help that I'm not good at accepting and getting gifts that um, I didn't think I deserve as usual. But I'm, I'm better. But um, so there was these two things, and it just so happened that this this sermon was about uh, encompassed both. And one, um, I'm gonna try to make it short. One thing in one line in there that he said that I keep remembering is, and um, that it's just as important to receive as it is to give. And that's made a lot of difference because I know I can see how people feel when they're able to do that. I've had people get excited when they thought of something, when they've asked me what they can do. And 
I can't think of it. But if I come up with something, then they get real excited. And it's not so much what I deserve. It's not anything about what I deserve. It's because I've surrounded myself with good people. I've been surrounded by good people who give because they want to and because they need to and because they receive a lot from doing that. But, um, or have been told to do it by their sponsor. <laughs> um, but it just has drilled home that it is, I can't be so, you know, it's selfish not to accept help. It's selfish not to, to receive. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to get back to, I don't know, I can't imagine as much as people have done for me and our family, but it's pretty incredible. And it's, and it has a lot to do with this, the, the we's here. And um, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking your time listening to me. Thank you, Belinda. We all love everybody who knew Bob, love Bob. I'm so sorry for his passing. Um, Lassoon, you got like one minute left. You got anything you want to, that you left out? Anything else you want to put on there? Um, I think I'm okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, beautiful talk. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming tonight. Um, and the way we close is just because, I mean, the Zoom thing gets kind of loud and crazy when everybody tries to pray together. So I always just say, why don't we just mute ourselves and just go to our inner room and quietly say the Lord's Prayer to ourselves, and uh, just take a second with that. Amen. Thank you so much, Masoon. Thank you guys, everybody for participating and great to see everybody's beautiful face. Good to see you, Kurt. Yeah, Hanson. good to see you, Sam. Looking thank you, good, Masoon. man. Thank you very thank much, Masoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Masoon. Thank you, Masoon. Thank you. Good night. Great meeting as always. See you, everyone. Thank you, Masoon. Yeah. Thank you for having the meeting, Sam. Oh, thank you guys for a good Thanks for your service, Sam. I love it, Sam. Thank you guys. Thanks, Masoon. Thank you.